Our last chapter discussed genes and how genes are inherited, but now we're going to look at how those genes relate to chromosomes and how chromosomes can also relate to inheritance. So here is the essential knowledge required for AP Bio. This is some more essential knowledge required. And here we go. So uh, Mendel and his heredity factors, or hereditary factors, uh, are genes as we know them today. And we can show that genes are located on chromosomes. The location of a gene can be seen by tagging isolated chromosomes with a fluorescent dye that actually highlights the gene. So if you look at this picture right here, you can see these yellow portions, and this is where a particular gene has been tagged. Mendelian inheritance has its basis in the behavior of chromosomes. So mitosis and meiosis were first disco discovered or described in the late 1800s. And from that developed the chromosome theory of inheritance, which states that Mendelian genes have specific lo loci, loci, or positions. Um, and those are located on the chromosomes. The chromosomes then undergo segregation or separation and independent assortment, meaning they segregate independently of each other. The behavior of chromosomes during meiosis can account for Mendel's law of segregation and independent assortment. So if you look at this figure, you can see that you have your yellow round seeds and your green wrinkled seeds, the chromosomes within them, and these are the gametes, which then um, nope, just kidding, those are not the, these are gametes produced right here in the second one. These are gametes that are produced by meiosis. When fertilization occurs, these two come together and you have a recombination of genetic information right here um, in each of these two cells. So the law of segregation tells us that two alleles for each gene separate during gamete formation. So um, here we have the two alleles for this small gene on the blue chromosome, and as you can see, it's going to separate here during gamete formation so that only one allele ends up in each cell. So over here, we have the law of independent assortment, which tells us that alleles of genes on non-homologous chromosomes assort independently during gamete formation. So you can see how here they line up with the red chromosomes, the red homologous pairs on the left, and the blue on the right, while the law of independent assortment tells us they really can line up in any way, shape, or form as long as the homologs are lining up together. So as a result, you can end up with all of these different variations in the gametes down here. So if these are your gametes, then when your F1 generation produces your F2 generation, you now end up with a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio in an F1, F1 cross-fertilization. Thomas Hunt Morgan was an embryologist who came up with the first evidence that actually associated a specific gene with a specific chromosome. So Morgan's experiments with fruit flies uh, provided convincing evidence that chromosomes indeed are where Mendel's heritable factors are located. So he chose fruit flies because they're very convenient when it comes to using them for genetic studies, and often colleges use fruit flies for genetic studies. So uh, the reason they're so great to use is because they produce many offspring. They do so every two weeks. They can have a new generation. And they only have four pairs of chromosomes, which makes it relatively easy to look at certain traits. So Morgan noted he, there were wild-type phenotypes, and those were the ones that were considered normal, that are very common in fly populations. And then alternative to the wild types, he called mutant. So if you look on the left here, the red-eyed fruit fly is the wild type, and the right-eyed, the white-eyed fruit fly on the right is the mutant. So he did this experiment where he mated male flies with white eyes with female flies with red eyes. So remember, white is mutant, red is wild type. So he found that the F1 generation all had red eyes, but the F2 generation showed the three to one red to white eye ratio. However, only the males had the white eyes. So Morgan determined that somehow that white-eyed mutant allele must be located on the X chromosome. So this supports the chromosome theory of inheritance. So as you can see, he took his red-eyed and his white-eyed um, 
fruit flies mated them, and they all had red, red eyes in the F1 generation. And then in the F2, uh, this is what he saw. And here, if you watch the genes, this is what happened here. If you look at the combinations or the way the chromosomes recombine to create the F2 generation. There are varieties of sex chromosomes, and in humans, there are two that code for sex. So there's a larger X chromosome and a smaller Y chromosome. And the ends of the Y chromosomes have regions that are homologous with regions of the X chromosome, but they're two different sizes, so it's only that small, the end of the Y, the ends of the Y chromosome. And there is a gene called the SRY gene on the Y chromosome, and that codes for a protein that is going to direct the development of male anatomical features instead of female anatomical features. So here is a picture of the X and the Y chromosome as they're replicating during mitosis. Okay, of course, you know, females have two Xs, males have an X and a Y. So each ovum is going to contain an X chromosome, and the sperm can contribute either an X or a Y. Um, it, there are other methods of sex determination in other animals, so just remember that this X and Y chromosome, we're specifically talking about humans here. So if you have two parents, obviously the mother is XX and the father is XY. The gametes that can be formed, only, only the females can pass on the X chromosome, but the males can pass on the X or the Y after they've divided during mitosis. I'm sorry, during meiosis. So this is one possible way that sex can be determined. Grasshoppers have an X0 system, so if they inherit two Xs, then they're male, and if they inherit one X, they're female. Uh, chickens have a ZW system. Um, ZW gives you a male and two Zs gives you a female. And then there's a haplodiploid system. So a diploid B, for example, will be male and a haploid B will be female. A gene that is located on, a, on either sex chromosome is called sex-linked because the gene is linked to the chromosomes that determine sex. So genes on the Y chromosome, we refer to them as Y-linked genes, but there are very few of them. The Y chromosome is relatively small. And there are genes on the X chromosome, and of course those are called X-linked genes. And chromosomes, X chromosomes have genes for many characters that are not related to sex, whereas the Y chromosome mainly encodes genes that are related to sex determination. So for a recessive X-linked trait to be expressed in a female, then two copies of a recessive allele must be inherited, and that female must be homozygous for the particular trait. But a male only needs one copy of the trait, one copy of the recessive allele, in order to for the gene to be expressed, and we call this hemizygous. In X-linked recessive disorders, any X-linked recessive disorder, therefore, are going to be much more common in males than in females. So here are some examples. Remember, the capital letters represent a dominant allele, and the lowercase letters represent lowercase alleles. So you can see here the various combinations and the frequencies with which males and females inherit these disorders. There are some of the disorders that are caused by recessive alleles on the X chromosome in humans are color blindness, um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and hemophilia. In mammals, in females, one of the two X chromosomes is randomly inactivated during embryonic de development. So the inactivated X chromosome condenses into what is called a bar body. So if the female is heterozygous for a particular gene located on the X chromosome, uh, she will be a mosaic for that character. So for example, uh, we have cats, calico cats. And the allele for orange fur and the allele for black fur are both located on the X chromosome. So um, as the cell divides, you can see that on the left-hand side, if the active X chromosome has two cell populations in adult cats, 
if the X if the active X chromosome has the black allele that will have then the black fur will be exhibited and if the active X chromosome has the orange allele on it then the orange fur will be expressed. Genes that are linked tend to be inherited together and the reason that they are inherited together is because they are located near each other on the same chromosome. So each chromosome is going to have hundreds or possibly thousands of genes except for the Y chromosome and the the more closely two genes are located on a chromosome, the more likely it is that they will be, excuse me, inherited together and we call those linked genes. Morgan figured this out again using fruit flies to see how the linkage is going to affect, to affect the, inher excuse me, the inheritance of two characters. So he crossed flies with different traits in both body color and wing size. So he took wild type flies that had gray body and normal wings, and he crossed them with double mutants, so black-bodied flies that had vestigial wings. Note, the vestigial wings are smaller and kind of stumpy, where the normal wings are, are um, longer. So in the F1, what he found was that he got um, a dihybrid, di, sorry, dihybrid that was all wild type. In the F2 generation, when he did his test cross, you can see down here what he found, um, that if the genes are located on different chromosomes, uh, they were found in a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio, so they were, there was an equal chance that they were going to be inherited by each of the offspring. But if they're located on the same chromosome and the parental alleles are always inherited together, then you saw a much different outcome, as you can see down here on the bottom. Morgan also found that body color and wing size are usually inherited together in specific combinations, which he called parental phenotypes. And he noted that these genes don't sort independently, so they, they sort themselves together. So he reasoned that they were on the same chromosome, and that was the only way it would happen. So if you look here, um, we have an F1 dihybrid female and a homozygous recessive male in a test cross. So uh, here we have our female, and here we have our male. And... Uh, most of the offspring either look like this or they look like this, which is an illustration of what we were just talking about. So uh, he also noticed that there were non-parental phenotypes that were also produced. So understanding this result is going to involve the exploration of what is called genetic recombination or the production of offspring with combinations of traits that are different from either parent, which makes sense genetic, the root is gene, and to recombination, the root is to recombine. So we're recombining genes in a different combination. So recombination of unlinked genes is governed by the independent assortment of chromosomes. So Mendel, he observed that combinations of traits and offspring differ from either parent. And offspring with a phenotype that matches one of the parental phenotypes are called parental types because they look like their parents. And offspring with non-parental phenotypes, which have new combinations of traits, are called recombinant types or recombinant. And there's a 50% frequency of recombination observed for any two genes on different chromosomes. So here is an example. I'm sorry. He also discovered, Morgan, we're talking about now, discovered the genes could be linked, but the linkage was incomplete because some of the recombinant phenotypes were observed. And he proposed that there must be some process that might occasionally break a physical connection between genes on the same chromosome. And uh, later it was determined that that mechanism was the crossing over of homologous chromosomes during prophase one of meiosis. So, as you can see here on the left-hand side, you have your red chromosome and its copy, and your pink chromosome and its copy, and they pair up, and they exchange genetic information. And so where these genes would typically be inherited together when crossing over occurs, uh, they are no longer inherited together. So this, these recombinant chromosomes bring alleles together in new combinations in the gametes, which further lead to genetic variation. And then, when random fertilization happens, that even further increases the number of new recombinations or variant combinations that can be produced. So it is the, abund the abundance of genetic variation that is the raw material upon which natural selection works.